Welcome everyone. My name is Stephen Halasnik and I'm co-founder and managing partner of Financing Solutions. Financing Solutions is the leading provider of lines of credit to nonprofits. Our line of credit program is easy, inexpensive, and costs nothing until used, making a great cash backup plan for your nonprofit. If you'd like to learn more about the program, please visit us at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. And if you decide to apply today, we will even give you a $250 credit on file. Or feel free to give us a call at 862-207-4118. Just remember the time to set up your line of credit is now before you have a problem so that when you do have a problem, an emergency or an opportunity that comes up, your line of credit is ready to go. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with Gail Gifford from Cause and Effect Incorporated. Gail has spent most of her time in the trenches organizing for peace, environmental, human, and civil rights. She served as a Director of Development and Communications at Plan USA, as Deputy Director, Director of Development and Marketing at Save the Bay, and as Dr Director of Development at City Year, Rhode Island, before launching her consulting business in 1996. In 2002, Gail earned the Advanced Fundraising Credential ACFRE from the Association of Fundraising Professionals, a distinction held by only 100 or so fundraisers worldwide, as well as getting her master's in organization and management from NTOC University in New England. In Gail's spare time, she's a volunteer and board member currently serving as a board president at Blackstone Academy Charter School and most recently as the vice chair of the board at Water Fire Providence. She also serves on the advisory council for the Latino Dollars for Scholars of Rhode Island and the Rhode Island Museum of Science and Art. Gail, welcome to today's Nonprofit MBA podcast. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, just Great. a quick update on that. I just termed out of my board at Blackstone Academy Charter School. So it's just last week, as a matter of oh. fact. So, how, how long were you there? Um, working as a board member, I think uh, nine or 10 years. Um, oh, yeah. Good. Cool. Um, as chair for three, but. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so Gail, to be fair, speak up a little bit when you can, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, it's such a great, amount of experience, you can see that you've done so much hands-on work that, you know, today's topic, which is get smart, what your board needs to know about nonprofit fundraising, because of your experience, I guess you've kind of seen this topic from kind of both sides of the aisle, when we so to speak. Would you say so? Yes, absolutely. I, um, and, you know, from all sides of the aisle, I think, as staff, trying to work with board members as a consultant who works with organizations, you know, on as a board member myself, um, all of those different pieces and everybody has different ideas about uh, what fundraising and boards should be doing together. How, how do you think you've changed over the years in your approach to fundraising? Hmm. That's an excellent question because I think I started my career differently from a number of people. So I started at a national organization, which was part of an international federation. And we were really a direct marketing shop. That was what we did. You know, we had television and print and um, direct mail acquisition and we did direct mail really almost all of our um, yeah. retention was direct mail and our upgrading and everything done through that way. Um, yeah. We had a very small grants program at the beginning and our audience was national. And yeah. as I moved through the years that switched from being this kind of broadcast kind of fundraising to much more personal, intimate, community-based Face to face, you know, really getting to know your donors and being part of the community. So I, I think that's been a, um, just a personal change and a personal journey over time. Um, the other part is I've moved away from any dogma about uh, what fundraising really and yeah. begun as most of our profession to rely more and more on what's the research tell us. 
you know, what can we learn from research and not just from our hunches and, um, and even beyond, you know, research based experience and then other people's research that's going on. Do you think it's, it's, it, uh, was natural for, well, not, did you think fundraising came naturally to you or do you think it's something that you had to kind of get used to (laughs) you personally? Um, I learned it and actually going back to when you started, you know, that an initial life of being in the trenches um, in peace work and justice and social movement work. Uh, some of my early mentors were people who recognized the power of money to enable them to do more work, reach more people, be more uh, influential. And so they didn't shy away from fundraising. And I have to say those early days included a lot of spaghetti dinners, you know, (laughs) newsletters, letters, and, um, and then gradually into face to face. Yeah. What do you, what do you think that the, I mean, the boards that you work with now, um, and when you come on as a consultant to kind of work with boards, What's the number one biggest issue that they typically have when it comes to the idea of fundraising? So I'll tell you what the what boards and industries have, and then I'll kind of move you into where I think the the focus needs to be. Yeah. Right. So the the whole industry, and boy, it keeps consultants busy, is trying to get individual board members to participate in fundraising to some extent, right? So that's yeah. a, a huge focus of so many people and you know what you have are amateurs right for the most part Um, your board members aren't trained fundraising professionals uh, or few are (laughs) you get a few everybody wants them Um, but they're they're not that Um, so there's a lot of uh, squabbles about um, this expectation on too many fundraisers part that just because somebody comes on a board, suddenly they have all the secrets to fundraising um, countered with them not wanting board members to muck around and telling them what's effective and what isn't effective. So you get these, uh, you know, lots of squabbles about what should be the board's role in fundraising. Um, I think that's the, the number one thing. And, Uh, The way I approach that is the number one responsibility of boards to fundraising, and that's why I'm really hot on sort of get smart, is to make sure that the organization is having the impact that it needs to be having on the community, right? That it really is doing the work effectively and well and focused on making the change it wants to see in the world. You think part of the issue is that, you know, again, a lot of our listeners have very small nonprofits. It's under mm-hmm. $5 million in sales, you know, I mean, um, revenue, excuse me. It, um, you know, mainly maybe the million dollar range. Do you think part of, so they're relatively newer. Um, do you think the issue is the expectation when a board member comes on is never set correctly where they say, this is your role on the board and, you know, Certainly, there are other roles that they might be having on the role on the board, but but that maybe eighty percent of the board is supposed to be out bringing in funding is uh, is that accurate? So this is the way I look at the board's role in fundraising, and I think this is the part that organizations miss. Right, is the analysis. All right. So what's the revenue model for the organization? Which at the board level, at the corporate governance level of the board, the revenue model is is critical to driving the organization. For um, many organizations, the revenue model is earned revenue and or grant funding, grants and contracts, a lot of Mm. government funding, Mm. right, for many, many organizations. Um, And that those pieces of the revenue model usually don't depend a lot on volunteer board members fundraising. They're yeah. usually staff driven. Now, yeah. if we're talking about an all volunteer organization, that's something different entirely, right? Yeah. Um, so so when board members step into fundraising, they um, really are entering into kind of a staff-based role, right? So if, if big organizations 
don't ask their board members to do a lot of right. fundraising. Smaller right. organizations do. And the reason they do is because they have limited staff. And so they're looking for the extra hands and the extra contacts uh, to do that. So the organization really has to go through uh, what's the most valuable role for board members in if they if they believe as a board that they should be participating in some way, fundraising in some way, right? That um, once we get past the, are we doing the work that we need to be doing? Do we have a plan and a strategy that matches up against the capacity investment, sort of all the things fundraisers need in order to be able to make a good case to the community and do the work that they do? Um, do we know what the right revenue are we investing, where we get the highest return on investment? You know, all of those things board members need to be smart about organizationally. Then we get down into the, okay, what do we do as volunteers? Right. And my feeling is that there are two things that are most important as volunteers. One is to be thinking about your organization all the time. And so every person you meet you are thinking about, hmm, what's their connection to our organization or what's their potential to be connection to, connected to our organization? You know, is this a good partnership for us? Is this somebody who might be interested in our work? Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you how proud I am of serving on this organization and what we're doing and our mission. Um, so, so really being promoters of an organization is sort of number one. Um, number two is thanking people. So we do have research that says that if board members thank donors, that they tend to stay around longer, those donors, um, and may give more as donors. Um, so that's the next piece. That's everybody can do that, um, especially with the support and assistance of the development staff, if there is one, right, to help help board members yeah. participate in thanking donors. Um, and then you get down to the okay, do we need people to actually be inviting folks to events or inviting them to site visits? Um, and all the way down to who are the potential co-solicitors, right? You don't need everybody to be that, yeah. right? Um, and, I, and we try and force, the mistake we make organizationally is to force every board member to become a solicitor, hmm. right? Not everybody's good at sales. Not everybody's good at that work. And it does take time. And um, and other and people come on the board for lots of different reasons, right? Have you ever seen um, where you you go to a, a board that you were asked to come on board, you know, as a consultant maybe, um, and you have one person who just really is good at fundraising and, mm -hmm. and has this um, attitude about the idea that because they're so great at fundraising and bringing in so much money that they are, um, that kind of their ego gets out of whack a little bit. Have you, have you, you know, like in other words, they're contributing so much more to the organization and either maybe they get annoyed with the other board members and they, you know, they think that they're kind of better than the other ones are in, in that, have you seen that I, that type of thing happen before? I mean, but not not a lot, not mm. a lot. Usually, people are just grateful for the other board members who are willing to go out and raise money. If some other board members are willing to participate in that, yeah. Um, yeah. But I do think boards and and staff undervalue the sort of knowledge, strategy, um, big picture thinking other talents that boards need and require so that sometimes that all that other work um, gets lost and not valued as highly as someone who has the connections and they can and and comfort with you know being able to raise funds you think in today's age of social media and you know like you were mentioning when you were involved earlier on in nonprofits that, you know, it was direct mail, right? And now you have so many other vehicles um, to make contacts um, that it can get, it, you know, all these other means of soliciting, 
it, it, it gets confusing to the idea that people still want to deal with people mm -hmm. and that a board can lose sight of that, you know, even when it comes down to, okay, well, let's have a barbecue or, you know, all these smaller type of campaigns that lead themselves to very little impact on big financial numbers and the versus, you know, the old school reaching out and talking to people um, personally. Do you, th have you seen that where you have to move boards away from those type of plans more toward the weak personal? So uh, if you left it, if you left developing a fundraising plan solely to volunteer board members, they would choose everything that required the least amount of them having direct contact with donors, yeah. <laughs> direct ask, right? So they would let their fears drive them um, more than saying what's the most effective work to be doing. So yeah. yeah, they would choose, oh, let's send e-newsletters out and e-requests first, you know, which has probably the lowest return um, on investment um, in those responses. And then, you know, they probably would think of an event uh, because they can imagine selling tickets to an event more than they could ask somebody for the same amount of money straight up, right? Or for, for more straight up. Um, because they're still in the mindset a lot that you have to give people something in order to get their money. You know, you, there's a lot of sense of, oh, people will give to us if they have a dinner or if they, you know, it, that's what the event world is like. Um, it's just it feels easier to sell something tangible than to sell something intangible. And is there a name for that? You know, because like, you, you know, I'm sure you've heard of like buyer's remorse or someone, you know, you buy something and then you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I just bought this $30,000 car. Is there a name for that in, in the It probably is, world? but I don't know yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It'd be a good name. So how do you, as a consultant coming on to help a board with fundraising, to learn about that, how do you uh, kind of uh, get past that point where people are very reluctant? What, what do you do? So I, so a few things. One, right, I try and first of all, get them back focused on, do we have the best product that we're selling? Because anyone in sales knows you can't sell something that's a bad product um, for very long, right? I'm still saying business. So they, so they need to really take that seriously. They need to understand um, and stick to a revenue model and invest accordingly in the organization and make sure they have the capacity they need if they can afford staff to really staff it up. And then the next most important thing for them is to really tap deep into their own passion and commitment around the organization. And so that requires creating and treating and I think this is another area where, where organizations fall down is they just assume because somebody came on the board that they get it, like that they really understand the organization and that they really have a deep emotional connection. Some do, but most don't. Even in organizations where you say, oh, we're recruiting board members because they're passionate about the mission. Um, they may be passionate about the environment, but they may not be passionate enough about the work your specific organization does. So they need to have experiences that really energize them, right? And get them to understand how important the work is to feel it at a real visceral level. And then they need the tools to be able to relate the work to the money. So that's the initial work that I do and that needs to be done um, in organizations is really to help the staff think, if you didn't believe that fundraising was the board's job, which it's not automatically, um, but if you didn't grow up believing that or be have that drummed into your head, then how would you empower these individuals to partner with you to raise money? And, and that's the way to get people engaged in fundraising. So. I mean, from, your, 
from your experience, are executive directors in general um, extroverted people who are good at fundraising? That I no. Oh, really? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. No. They I care. Think, They're more. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, uh, there are many paths. So there are many paths to growing an organization, right? Um, for for many many organizations, securing government funding is the path to growth. And so, especially in the social services world and the health world, I mean, that's really the way many organizations grow is their ability to pull down government grants. Um, mm. And so that does require understanding the field. You know, that's in many ways, that's more on the program side. So executive directors may come up through the program ranks and they're, they they can be good at relationships without being extroverts, right? They can be good at policy without being extroverts, and many are. Um, so so those those organizations are built that way. I you know I have a bias that organizations which are built relying on philanthropy have not I wouldn't even say necessarily extroverted directors, but certainly directors who know how to tap into community wealth. Um, and that may start with their own personal wealth and family wealth or friends or their own networks, um, or that they are good at, at soliciting. They are good at cultivating and making relationships and tying people into their causes. Um, yeah. But new you know huge effective organizations with lots of revenues that don't depend on philanthropy philanthropic yeah. contributed income right that develop that depend on um, government grants um, and contracts and and earned revenues so um just to test my understanding about what you're saying is that or even regardless if you have a new board member that's coming on, that it's it's really important for someone, it could be the, the the chairman of the board or the president of the board or the executive director, to make sure that the people who are on the board always understand, make them feel the passion of this of what's being provided by the um the mission. Like show them real life examples of what is going on out there so that they stay connected to the cause and they feel they begin to feel passionate about it. Um, because I guess you, a lot of times in board meetings, even the ones, you know, the ones that I've been on, sometimes you're, you're, do, you're working on so much of the day to day stuff or the, the bigger picture stuff that you, you know, you, you lose sight sometimes of the passion of what you're really doing to help people or to help a cause or whatever. That's important to bring that up on a, on, on a constant basis. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. People, we bring on board members and then we stop treating them as the potential donors or volunteers that they are. Right. Mm. So it's like they move from this person that needs to be cultivated and developed and relationships built to an operative that, you know, is, I don't know, robotically inclined, you know, supposed to know what to do and participate. And um, that misses, you know, I always say, think about what it would have been like to found your organization. Like who are the people sitting around the table and what were they talking about? And I'm pretty sure they weren't talking about their spreadsheets. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, they, yeah. maybe more of them should have been. But, yeah. um, you know, they were talking about the things they cared about, right? That the, the, the land was being bought up by developers or the water was polluted or kids had bad schooling or were going to jail or, you know, whatever that might be. Those were the issues and the things that got them passionate to make them want to create an organization to go out and build this thing. That's what board members too often organizations lose. 
yeah. as they grow and get older. So that fire, right, gets lost. And it especially gets lost at the board meeting level. So how do you keep that fire alive and then enable people to not only have that fire about the mission, but be able to talk about how their organization is addressing it, right? And what money can buy. So what can money buy? (laughs) How does it solve problems? And I think we don't, as staff, do a good enough job or as, you know, board leadership, a good enough job in making sure everybody understands that. I I could see, like, if I was an executive director, I would make sure that before every meeting starts, we just, I would just tell them a story of something that went on where the money that was used helped a particular person, a case study, so to speak, Uh, um, that, that might make sure that people understand this is why this is so important. Yeah. Um, I mean, people call it mission moments, but it may, uh, you know, when, when we could meet anywhere, right. Um, it all also often helps to meet in different places that also show the work. Mm. So, you know, I think about, I worked with a Ronald McDonald house and, uh, you know, a board meeting at the neonatal, you know, at the hospital where they could tour the neonatal intensive care unit where so many of the family members who stayed at the Ronald McDonald house came from because their kids were in the, ho- their babies were in the hospital wow. yeah. um, and to listen and, you know, get a briefing from the staff there. So seeing it, right. And getting a staff uh, a medical briefing makes it so much more real and intense or, or having a family member who benefited from the organization come speak to them um, about what it meant to them, right? Yeah, or getting uh, out on the trails if you're with an environmental land trust, um, you know, really seeing uh, what these issues are gets people passionate about the work. And it also gets them passionate about being on the board because they're not only sort of doing the good work for the organization, but they're also learning stuff themselves and having yeah. unique experiences um, that build their loyalty to the organization as well and to each you, other. You alluded, you alluded to this before, but um, I, you know, when you're coming in to, as a consultant for the board, Um, to help with, you know, to teach them about fundraising. Are you, um, are you helping each board member find their voice or are you helping, are you mainly helping facilitate the group as a whole to help them as a group um, find the, you know, address the issue of fundraising as a group or is it more individualized? So it's always works better if you're actually going to try and enable people to participate, to work one-on-one, right? That everybody does need to speak authentically their own voice um, and, and help people find the pieces of fundraising that they're willing to participate in. Right. Because not everybody has to do everything. Not everybody has to do the same thing. Right. Um, But there is some core knowledge about the way fundraising works and what is, you know, sort of good fundraising work and um, research fundraising work versus what isn't and expectation. So there's some core knowledge around the profession and the organization's approach that board members need to know as a group. Um, And they can participate in trainings as a group, but those trainings designed to, again, tease out, you know, all all the good trainings and engagement are about getting board members to speak about what they're passionate about the organization and also to explore their own relationship with money, (laughs) you know, is another part, right? So what what are their own thoughts around money and talking about money, you know, all the things that create barriers to board members, if they need to, wanting to participate in fundraising. And again, not every organization needs all their board members to be the solicitation team 
you know, that's yeah. just not the case. Um, yeah. But they do need them to be able to talk about the organization and they do need them to understand the intricacies of the organization and be so smart you know, about let's that. Say you, let's say you have five people on the board. Do you go in there and say, and like, do you articulate that? Say, not everybody here has to be good at fundraising. You know, um, how do you kind of articulate that? I always, I, I like to tell stories, right? Uh, yeah. um, and uh, a good friend of mine who's like one of the most fabulous fundraisers ever, who um, is a great fundraiser for boards. Um, I've got a little story on my own blog that's about how two volunteers basically raised $11 million for their organization. That was a little more than that. But there were there were four core people, the executive director, the development director, and two board members who were the leaders of this campaign. And they pretty much did all the work of the campaign. And their attitude was... Um, every all the board members were supportive of the campaign. They all believed in the cause. Um, in this case, everybody made a gift, and those who had a lot of means, you know, made larger gifts. But we didn't expect them all to have to participate. You know, so we we went with the people who wanted to, who were ready, and yeah. or, or with a little training were were able, but who wanted to who found pleasure in this, who wanted to make that happen. Um, and they were successful. Yeah. You ever, you ever have a situation where you go in and none of the board members kind of like want to do it, felt that they could be good at it. You know, it was like no one really was stepping up. Um, again, I, I, I do less of that individual training and more around the systemic stuff in the organization. But my colleagues do a lot of that individual work. You know, yeah, my yeah. work is is much more focused on um, helping them understand how to build a good, strong uh, revenue development program, fundraising program, where to invest, to invest enough. Um, and then to think about their role in that. Okay, so so your role you, usually uh, when you come on, but when when the executive director or board president asks you actually asks, asks you to come on, majority of the time it's to kind of build a a format and process for overall fundraising. Yeah, for for just being stronger as a whole, helping them understand what they're doing well, what they're missing, you know, how they could strengthen. Um, boards are tremendously reluctant in organizations to invest sufficiently in the fundraising capacity that they need. So a lot of my time is getting them to think about investing in staff, you know, and, and or um, how to think about evaluating whether their programs are successful or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I so I spend in my own consulting practice I spend more time at that level. Um, although we do you know we do a certain amount of work helping board members stage through their campaigns whatever those might be. And the very first thing we do is not getting them out there asking for money, but is getting them out there doing discovery interviews, which is just talking to donors and potential donors to understand what they know about the issues, what they know about the organization, and also what those people care about themselves, you know? So getting to know, like, that's the best thing. And, and I do that with strategic planning as well. And the other work that we do a lot of is let's just get board members out having conversations with people in their community because that's the number one starting yeah. place. And they'll probably figure it out after they do that, right? They'll figure out a, a, a kind of a good strategic uh, plan after they start talking to people. Let's face it, a lot of people on the boards are probably pretty um, savvy, right? Yeah, um, well, with, you know, with support and guidance, but um, especially if they're looking at putting together a fund development plan, that they definitely need support and guidance. But the very first thing to sort of practice is to get board members out just talking to people. like 
just yeah. talking to people. <laughs> and, and I would even say board members. I mean, I've worked with executive directors who hate fundraising beyond grants. They hate asking for money. Um, their first thing is to just go out and talk to people. Yeah. You know, just get them out talking to people. Because the more that they can do that and understand these other folks and understand um, who they are and what they care about and how they talk about the world and what they think about their organization and their mission and their cause, the more effective they're ultimately going to be. And the more relaxed you get about having conversations with people, it's what is surprising to me is how reluctant people are to have conversations with other people, whether they're board members or staff members, just how reluctant they are to have a conversation. Yeah. How would you do that? Let's say you're a board president and you say, Gail, I buy into what you're saying that we all need to get out there and, and just listen and talk. And, you know, you know, how would, How's the, how would we go about doing that? Yeah, well, it helps to have a script and to have questions and to do a little training, right? So get the board members interviewing each other with uh, guided questions, right? So that they get comfortable doing that. And then, you know, you've also worked with the group to figure out who they should go talk to and why. Um, in you know, in that, I mean, there's this, there's this saying in the fundraising world, right? Um, if you want money, ask for advice. I, I don't, you've probably heard that, right? But, sure. Um, we want to engage people in solving our problems. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what donors want to do, right? They give you money because they want you to solve a problem or achieve something beautiful, right? Make yeah. something beautiful happen. Um, yeah. So get them involved in thinking about that. That's the first place to start. Yeah, I also want to hear when I go donate money um, that it was worthwhile. Yeah. You know, uh, that really, that it made, that we're getting results, you know. So, I mean, that's important to me. I also want to be thanked, which in some of the larger organizations, you know, honestly, it's easy to send a, a formatted email out. Yeah. But it's not, you know, I don't get calls. So, you know, it's not, you know, especially I mean, nowadays. It could even be a handwritten note or, you know, yeah. or oh, just yeah. something that even says that the number one reason after financial changes that people stop giving is because they feel the organization was indifferent about them. Like just they didn't matter, right? Their gift didn't matter. They didn't acknowledge it timely. They didn't ever hear anything about what was going on, you know, how they're, they're, they weren't even sure when they gave the money that the organization knew what they were giving the money for, you know, yeah. because they got one of those form emails, <laughs> yeah. whatever. Yeah. So people do want to be appreciated for their giving, but they, they want to be appreciated for the act of giving. We know this from the research for the act of giving. And they want to know, as you said, what happened. Yeah. So we, we have a, a minute or two mm -hmm. left. Maybe you could uh, just uh, kind of give us one you know, top thought about a takeaway that you'd want our listeners to, to know from today's conversation um, that you would think it would, would make the biggest difference to an executive director or a board member who's really trying to help, you know, for, you know, design or develop fundraising. What's the number one takeaway from today? So a, a colleague of mine who does storytelling um, told me of a, a proverb that goes, the community goat starves to death, right? So being that when you got the whole group there and you ask them to do something, Oh, yeah, it's very easy for everybody to say, yep, 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 right? Yep, yep, yep. And then there's no accountability. Nobody does anything. So the, I think the most important lesson, if you're trying to engage people in the process of working with potential donors and getting them to fundraise, whoever they are, staff board, is a one-on-one. -on -one. You've got to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, people um, don't know what to do. Um, they can hide behind other folks' commitments. 
you just have to move them from one place to another developmentally. And that's both in their own thinking about the organization as well as their own thinking about their relationship to the organization and then their relationship to other community members to help support that organization. And that's got to be one-on-one, has to. Yeah. That's the way it's going to be effective. I think it's obvious that bringing on someone like yourself to kind of help people just ease back, ease into the idea of, you know, having those conversations, you know, I can imagine even a couple of hours of training makes a huge difference. Would you kind of agree? You must see it every day, the transformation that happens. That's a starting point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But getting to know, getting to know the folks, your own board members, um, what they like, what they care about, you know, what they, what, how they want to make a difference for your organization, um, helping them find a path because they really don't know what to do. Yeah. You know, if you say, oh, we need you to go out and talk to some people, they, they don't know the first thing about where to start or how to start. They just yeah. don't. You know? Yeah. Um, unless they're that rare breed of board member who's participated in a lot of fundraising campaigns before, and they really do sort of know that that's the work they want to participate in. But otherwise yeah. it's get to know board members. They're people too. Yeah. You know, they're stuff. not as a friend of mine, another colleague of mine, deceased colleague said, um, board members are human beings, not seats. Right? Yeah. Well, it's really good stuff. I mean, learned a lot today. I really appreciate, um, you know, today we were speaking with Gail from Cause and Effect for coming on to today's, you know, I would like to thank her for coming on today's podcast. And if you like today's podcast, please feel free to share it with a friend and also subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. If you like today's podcast, please give us a review on your podcasting app. You know, the nonprofit uh, NBA podcast has become extremely popular and, uh, very proud of the work that we're doing here. If you like, uh, and and of course, if you're, if you feel like your nonprofit needs a line of credit, which I think that every nonprofit should have one just as a backup plan. I think it just makes complete sense. I can't tell you how many times I get clients who thank us for working with them. And, um, and uh, you know, they didn't think they were going to have to use it and they end up using it. And usually it's to make payroll, honestly, sometimes it's to continue a program when, when something was delayed. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Just feel free to give us a call. We're happy to answer any questions you have. The phone number is 862-207-4118. Or visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. Gail, if people want to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? Um, Gail, G-A-Y-L-E, at cfect.com. That's C-E-F-F-E-C-T, like cause and effect, cfect.com. That's yep. the best way to reach me. And then and your website is uh, www.cfect.com. Yeah, 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 sounds cool. Good. <clears throat> well, everybody, I want to thank everybody for having, uh, to, for doing what you're doing, all our listeners, for helping make the world a better place. We certainly all need to do our part. And we also uh, just want to just send out kudos to all of you for, you know, getting through a very tough year, both in your nonprofit and in your personal lives, I'm sure. So, you know, summer's coming. United States. And I think we're all happy that it's going to, that it's coming and things are going to get better. I'm sure. So Gail, thanks for coming on today and everybody have a fantastic day.